On this episode, we meet David Kelts, an actor who has memorized the collected works of Edgar Allan Poe, partly because he loves the writing, partly because he needed a job, but mostly because somebody's got to do it. A single dim ray, like the thread of a spider, shot from out the crevice and fell upon the vulture eye. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered, weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore. I realize Edgar Allan Poe is not the most obvious subject for a light-hearted show that celebrates passionate people on purpose-driven missions. But make no mistake, David Kelts is passionate about Poe, and he's on a mission to keep his writings alive. It occurred to me that we could help with an idea we fleshed out a few hours earlier in the production van. My producer, Ted, will attempt to explain. It's one of those origin stories about how he came to be the Poe guy. Right. And he is the Poe guy. But the Poe house is tiny and cramped and hilariously small. And so after that, I think we go off and we just go through the Raven and uh, get new suction cups. Oh, yeah, we caught that, I'm sure. Hey, Doug. Yes, sir. Whatever you did to that front one, <laughs> make sure it's slightly better than what you did to this one. Not enough spit. Gentlemen, I'm about to say something that could potentially be used as a, uh, as a stand-up. Okay. Are you ready? So, it's day three of our Baltimore adventure. That's the back of Ted's head. Uh, we also have uh, Steve up front driving. Mary's along for the ride. Doug Glover, of course, impersonating a cameraman. And that's Alex back there as well. It's like vacation. Taylor shooting the camera that I'm looking into right now. And all of us together in this giant SUV are going to uh, Edgar Allan Poe's home. Left on the Lombard. To look at his grave and uh, meet a guy who basically has assumed the identity for all intents and purposes of Edgar Allan Poe. And then maybe drive around town in some sort of moody homage to True Detective and recite things like The Telltale Heart and uh, The Raven? Yeah. Something like that? I think we'll start with The Raven because I think it's notable that this is the only city where the football team is named after a poem by a strange dead man. This is our gift to the city of, 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 of Baltimore. We're going to have a, a beautiful, well-wrought raven performance for the ages. Though we probably won't stick to Ted's plans, I have to admire his intentions. i got to assume that this is our guy. That would be your guy. Should we call him Edgar or David? We got a line on a guy who had supposedly assumed the identity of Edgar Allan Poe. I figured he was either crazy or perfect for this show, or maybe both. So I met him at the grave of one of my favorite writers and hope for the best. Well, mm -hmm. let, let's just focus on what I know for sure. You're mm -hmm. David. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we are in the graveyard yes. at Westminster. Yes, this Westminster is Westminster Church? Burying Ground. Mm -hmm. Edgar Allan Poe carried yes. one of these? He carried one more like this, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, these were really fighting canes. They weren't walking canes. A fighting cane? Well, you needed them in those times. Uh, they were called dog sticks sometimes to scare away the you know, dogs. There were a lot of wild dogs in the streets. And you know, there were people attacking people, mugging people, and whip it through the air. You feel it's good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> this is, I'm surprised yeah. people don't walk around with these I think they more often maybe more needed today than they were back then. So everyone carried them. Where is Edgar Allan Poe buried? <clears throat> well, right now he's buried over in the front. He uh -huh. was moved there in 1875. Um, <clears throat> originally he was right uh, around over here. You see where that marker is right there? That's the closest they could put a stone to where he actually was buried. People leave roses. Oh, they leave all kinds of things. One of the things you find most is pennies, <laughs> because. And about 1860, around the Civil War, the school teacher here in Baltimore sent children out on a campaign called it Pennies for Poe, and they raised $500 to put the monument that's up there in the front. Mm -hmm. But people still place pennies. You, you often come up here and find pennies, pennies, pennies. And he had the worst luck, both in life and after life. He was buried here without a marker. Many years passed before the family was getting a, a monument put together. And the monument yard was right by a train station. Well, a train crashed. The boxcar tumbled over, smashed the gravestone, so he didn't have a gravestone after all. 
guy couldn't get a break. <laughs> he could not get a break. So the original grave is what we just saw over mm -hmm. there. Where the school children took up the pennies for Poe. Yeah. They uh, collected enough to have him buried over here. So the tourists coming by could see his oh. grave. They leave mementos here as well as at the original. Oh, both places. You find artwork, you find all kinds of things. Once I saw a beautiful ice sculptor of a raven somebody left here, and it was right in the middle of winter, so that ice sculptor lasted a good while. Can I ask mm. you to stand right here for sure. a sec? Mm -hmm. mm. I just want to, yeah, yeah, yeah. Take the head off, it looks probably more like. I see it. Um, all right, you are dressed as Edgar Allan Poe. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, do you do this every day? Oh, no. Uh, I, I would like to work every day. I love doing it, but uh, I love doing the shows, and uh, <clears throat> I put it on at every opportunity. And when did you decide this was what you are going to do? Well, I had decided when I was um, a small child that I wanted to be an actor. That was one of my major passions in life. And then when I was about 13 years old, we were told by our teacher in this uh, English class to read this next story. So I glanced down at that first sentence and saw true, nervous, very, very dreadfully nervous I had been and am, but why will you say that I am mad? And I was drawn in by that sentence. The disease right the sharpened I my sense senses, it's not, not dulled. Ah, right. We will now perhaps take a ride to his sure. home. Mm -hmm. Let's do it. Right, let's mm -hmm. do that. After you. I'm at the gravesite of Edgar Allan Poe, getting to know a Poe impersonator named David Kelts. At first, David seemed like any one of the thousands of actors trying to eke out a living in community theater. <coughs> Pardon me. He also seemed to be fighting a nasty cough. To be honest, I was a little worried. But we were in his hands, and he wanted to show us more than Poe's grave. Baltimore and Poe share not only history, but mystery. Every year on Poe's birthday, a mysterious hooded figure would leave roses and cognac on Poe's gravesite. Did you ever see him? Yes, I did. I saw it a couple times. This went on for 60 years, and no one knows who the hooded figure is. I met a man named John King, the then curator way back then in the early 70s, he told me that he was sending his guides out to, to do it. And he admitted it. Well, I guess we can put that into the solved category. So whereabouts are we right now, David? In right Baltimore. now, we're in the west side of the city. This was one of only two other houses on this street. And when you look, when he looked out from those windows across this way, all he saw was fields and woods and meadows, all the way out to Frederick. This was his so, home. This was his home right here. The place has changed. Yes. <laughs> So this would have been their front parlor. This is this is his mother-in-law, and this is his wife here. That's a death portrait taken right after she died. How and common was that? Oh, they did that all the time back yeah. in the 19th century. So from the front parlor to mm. well, we can only speculate. It's not really documented anywhere. Most biographers assume that he had the top room. There's been speculation about it. I've done a number of. Uh, performances in this little room, The Telltale Heart, The Black Cat, mm -hmm. mostly just some of the short stories. David could talk about Poe all day, but what I really wanted to know was, how did he become the Poe guy? I left down in Miami, Florida and came up here in 1973. I was on my way to New York, but had to stop and see the Poe house on the way because I was researching doing a show. Volunteered immediately and wound up just staying here. Did you catch that? David's passion for the works of this melancholy poet caused him to derail his trip to New York to become an actor. Instead, he stayed in Baltimore and became Poe. Are you up for a brief uh, recitation of something? Sure. Mm -hmm. All right, collect your thoughts for a second. Hold on, you guys stay here. Who's that? Hey, Jones? Yes. Ted? Yeah. Mary, is she down there? Yeah, she is. Mm -hmm. You know, come up here. Sure. Yeah. Jones, you mm -hmm. sit here. You're, you're in the audience. True. Nervous, very, very dreadfully nervous I had been and am. But why will you say that I'm mad? 
The disease had sharpened my senses. <laughs> Not destroyed. Not dulled them. I mean, when uh, I'm, in, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in. What happens? What happens? <laughs> and, and. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. The beating of the heart, oh, the heart, the okay. beating. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, you want me to cut to the end? You want me to do the whole story? Or? I don't know. It's pretty good. <laughs> it is impossible to say how first the idea entered my brain. But once conceived, it haunted me day and night. Object? There was none. Passion? There was none. I loved the old man. He'd never wronged me. He'd never given me insult for his gold. If it looks like we're hanging on to every word, it's because we are. I think it was his eyes. Yes. And with violent gesticulations. What happened to him? meek, quiet, sickly David? I swung the chair upon which I sat and grated it. Where did his cough go? Again, hark, louder, louder. For the next 15 minutes, David cast his spell upon us. And by the end of Poe's most famous tale, we all wanted more. Villains! To stumble the law! I admit the deed. Tear up the planks. Here, here. It's the beating of his hideous heart. I love doing that in this room. It's great. You think? Uh, perfect. Uh, yeah, it's perfect. wonderful. It feels fantastic in here. At least, how many times have you heard him do that? This is the first time here. Yeah. And it is really the perfect house for it. Um, mm -hmm. Because it was written in a room like this. It was written for mm -hmm. a room like this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in the day, I mean, I would imagine that pieces like this were brought to life, right? I mean, it's very intimate. The rooms are small. The audiences have to be small. But the performances yeah. are big. And mm -hmm. they're right. Very in your face. Right yeah. in your face, <laughs> right. man. I mean, it's, that's <laughs> really, really powerful. Mm hmm. Oh, yeah. Poe's poems weren't just powerful, they were also personal. There are many theories on what, um, you know, who the people in these stories might have meant. And some pe people think that John Allen, for instance, was the old man right. in the story. Who's John and, Allen? And, uh, that was his foster father. Yeah. He took him in for the intention of adopting him, but then didn't and set Poe up to fail and then threw him out. He, here he was raised to be this southern gentleman, a gentleman of elegant leisure and then just cast out into a world of poverty. It put him in a terrible position of being uh, in what I think sociologists call status incongruity. One side of his personality was uh, very cultured and educated and talented and capable of doing so much. But then on the other hand, he didn't have the money, the means, uh, and, and you were completely ostracized in those times. You didn't have the money. It didn't matter how brilliant you were. But Poe was clever. He found a way to make a living, and in doing so, he created a new literary genre. He wrote these scathing reviews of uh, Gentlemen of Elegant Leisure because you didn't make money in those times by writing. He invented the genre literary criticism because magazines came into being at the time. He made a lot of enemies, especially in the literary world. He was a starving artist. I've had hard times as an actor, and uh, anybody who's in the literary field can, and they know the kind of struggle that he had, and I saw the tragedy of his life and how he had that. Uh, status incongruity uh, and the kind of suffering that comes with it, the kind of loneliness and alienation and depression. <laughs> I was wrong about David. He's not just another actor looking for work. David is an actor who was born to play a very specific role. He didn't wait for someone to cast him. Oh no, he cast himself and he memorized over 50,000 words for the part. That is a commitment. So we decided to provide this unique thespian with a slightly more cinematic stage. Okay, we've now come to uh, downtown Baltimore. What's happening at the moment, vis-a-vis -vis the show, is we are rigging up this uh, Cadillac that we found. And uh, the idea is to put Edgar Allan Poe in there. We cruise around town, and uh, he quotes the Raven. And if we do it right, I, I, don't, I don't really know what the purpose is. It'll look cool, though. Are you finding your inner motivation? I'm getting it. Mm -hmm. All right, it's going to be the Raven, all right? Okay. All right. Mm -hmm.
So I'm in Baltimore, Maryland with Edgar Allan Poe impersonator David Keltz, taking a deep dive into the meaning of Poe's most famous poem, The Raven. What's it mean? Yeah. Well, it's a poem about grief. He was trying to uh, get over his grief intellectually. And so it's saying that grief is all consuming and there's no escaping it in. This guy honestly would depress a hyena. Clinically depressed, you think? Oh, yes. Uh -huh. Did they diagnose it in that way in those days? They call it melancholy. Yeah. You know, he said he suffered from melancholy. I mean, it was a, an emotion that was sort of glorified in a way. And people, you know, when they grieved, they really grieved. And they would wear black for at least three years if somebody in their family died. In analyzing the raven, he says, I searched for the tone of the highest manifestation of beauty. Now, all experience has shown that this tone is one of sadness. Melancholy is thus the most legitimate of all poetic tones. <laughs> and he changed the world of literature in so many ways. That poem took the country by storm. Oh, yes, yes. That was, and yet he had a very difficult time trying to sell it and got only $15 for it. $15. <laughs> Poe had actually traveled himself. He had given lectures, he'd given talks, and he recited some of his own poetry and uh, other people's poems the way that I did at the house this afternoon. And I thought, well, he isn't here to do that anymore, but somebody should do it. You know. And that somebody is David Keltz. Years ago, he cast himself in the role of a lifetime, and he became Edgar Allan Poe. To express our appreciation, and because Doug is desperate to do something cinematic, David and I will now present the only great American poem with an NFL team named after it. Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered, weak and weary over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore. While I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. Tis some visitor, I muttered, tapping at my chamber door. Only this and uh, nothing more. Probably a problem, huh, Doug? Oh, yeah. It's gonna hand that to me and I'll put back in once we get on the small street. Yeah. Giving David a stage this big does come with its fair share of complications, including not having enough time to air the whole poem. And distinctly, I remember it. <laughs> it was in the bleak we'll December. Back that up just a little bit. <laughs> can, can we start that over again? Yeah. Sure. Uh, you guys let's see. Up here for a so we'll just skip to the end. But do yourself a favor. Go read The Raven out loud. Or better yet, go see David perform it. Leave my loneliness unbroken. Quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak from out my heart. And take thy form from off my door. Quoth the raven, nevermore. <laughs>